Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our uh, virtual roundtable in which we discuss uh, all matter of Beatles discussion, whether it's uh, their history or what's happening today or what's going to be happening in the future. And I think we're going to be uh, touching on those last two quite a bit in, uh, in, this, uh, in this show. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my three co-hosts. First of all, freshly back from Boston after having seen Paul McCartney at Fenway Park, um, uh, the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Hey, Ken. Hi, Al. And, and my head is still in the clouds at this moment. <laughs> I'll, I'll bet. And uh, also, rel- relatively freshly back. You know, I think you are freshly back from uh, from Las Vegas after having seen the uh, the Love Tenth Anniversary Show and all the attendant uh, hoopla. Is the uh, contributing uh, contributor to Billboard magazine and also to AXS.com and various other publications. And that's uh, Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. And last but certainly not least, our resident musicologist, also just back from uh, from Vegas have, after having seen the uh, the love anniversary. And that's a longtime contributor to Beatle Fan Magazine and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and various other publications. And that's Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Hello, Al. How you doing? And hello, everyone out there. <laughs> Gee, they all sound so tired. <laughs> Long trip, and it was yeah. 109 degrees out there. What was Bo yeah. thinking? Wait till, wait till you hear. Yeah, wait till you hear the stories. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> something. Mm. Well, uh, we should start with the uh, with the love. Uh, anniversary show and there's a lot to go into there's the the pre-show the red carpet the show itself uh the after party so uh steve why don't you why don't you start okay well we we i mean i don't know how much of this personal stuff you want to hear but we drove and we had we had, it was an interesting trip because it takes like normally 10 hours to get there and our air conditioning decided to uh give us some problems as we were coming into vegas and um but we got there and 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 uh so we got there wednesday night and it was hot and it never got below 100 all the time we were there but it's a dry heat it, or is it? it? It doesn't matter. It, it, <laughs> it was it was hot. It was hot. I mean, and fortunately, the the Mirage Hotel, which is a gorgeous place, and it, and uh, I recommend it highly, is air conditioned and, and beautiful inside. But the moment you stepped outside, it was like it was like walking into an oven. So anyway, um, uh, they had st- they started setting up in the morning on Thursday. And people started lining up in the afternoon. Uh, actually, there were people out there, ha- you know, hanging around, watching what was going on. And and, uh, and we saw several people that uh, we've known from other Beatle events. But uh, yeah, they started coming in, in the afternoon, um, and it started picking up around five o'clock. The place I was, I thought the room was going to be packed to the gills, and it really didn't seem to be. And of course, being in the middle of a gambling casino, nothing that did not stop. I, I couldn't see from where I was standing. I was on the red. I was standing at the end of the red car, at the very, very end of the red car. But I was like the last one, and I, so I couldn't see around the corner. But it started late, and as people were coming, you could hear people cheering. Of course, the big cheers were for Paul and Ringo and Yoko. Um, Olivia was on the advance list, and she did interviews with the L.A. Times, but she did not show up that night. And Danny, of course, was not there at all. But I was told by the publicist, and I asked this a couple of times because people kept saying, well, Olivia was there, Olivia was there. Well, no, mm. she, was not, she was not there for the show. Right. And, and Alan, you didn't see her, right? I didn't. I mean, I'd heard that she was ill, actually, subsequently. Right. right. Yeah, that's... that's what that's what the publicist told me that she she used the words unwell, and so that was the, that was the word I heard too that Olivia was not there. 
Although she, I did see a picture of her from the day before, and she looked fine. But something apparently happened, you know, between then and Thursday. But anyway, she was not there. Danny was not there. But Yoko and Sean were there. Yoko, uh, Yoko, I have not uh, seen Yoko that close before. Of course, she. I mean, anybody who has knows that she is not very tall. But she was walking very slowly. That's very- what we were just talking about that. And uh, I, uh, uh, it seems like the years are starting to finally catch up with her. I, I don't know. And it, she also did not talk very loudly. I talked mm-hmm. to somebody who actually interviewed her and she talked in a whisper. So mm. she was, mm. she was very, she looked her age. I, I, I don't want to use that. I hate to use that term, but she definitely looked uh, older. I mean, I've seen her in concert, and she's been, you know, when she's been very active, but she was not mm-hmm. very, very quickly or very well. The fact that she didn't go up on stage, I think that's right. also kind of revealing. She did. She did stand up and and give peace signs a couple of times because I that I could see her from my seat, and she did do that. She, you're right. She did not go down to the stage, but Paul and Ringo were there. Ringo came first with. Barbara and and Joe Wolf and his wife, and they were all they the four of them were in a group together. And Ringo, of course, is flashing the peace sign. He did talk a little bit. I tried to talk to him, and there was so much noise on that red carpet from the from people screaming and yelling that it was really hard to hear. And so he didn't say anything to me. And then Paul came last. He and Nancy posed once in the middle and then walked through, and they did not stop to talk to anybody. So, and of course, when Paul started coming, you knew the whole place erupted in screams. Everybody was yelling. Everybody was screaming. It was, yeah, it was like it should have been. I was surprised that in a, you know, in a small, I mean, that was not a big area that they were able to do that without any problems, but they, they managed to do it. It was, it worked, you know, it was fine. I should tell you who else was there i have the list giles was there and Mm -hmm. giles came through and posed and walked rather quickly um dominique champagne who was the writer director and the and and created love was there and there were a lot of should i say b and d list celebrities um oh oh, ron (laughs) howard ron howard Howard was there too but there were a lot of ron howard ron howard is a list a list, okay, but I, but I, at least I, right I, now. I, but there were <laughs> always, a lot, always, there were a lot of people that you know I had to uh, as they were coming through. They did not introduce them, and I did not know who they were. I'm going, I'm going. Who are these people? And and I, and I'm not a Hollywood per, gossip person, so it was kind of funny. Uh, I'll read some of these names. Mia Sorvino is somebody whose name I do recognize. Oh, sure. Josh Hutcherson, Nappy Tabs, you know. David Merkin from The Simpsons, uh, uh, Kevin Dillon was there. In fact, he stopped and talked for several minutes in front of, right in front of where I was standing. Christopher Backus, Aubrey Anderson Emmons from Modern Family, Dot Jones, Christoph St. John, Chris Harrison, um, Mark Foster of Foster the People, mm-hmm. Daniel Platzman, Chris Holmes, Ben McKee, uh, Nastia Liukin, I hope I pronounced that right, for, uh, an Olympic uh, uh, athlete, and Arlene Phillips, who I believe I did see. Uh, and then uh, Kevin uh, Nealon showed up, and that was not expected. He was not on the advance list. Um, but that was uh, that was about it. I mean, there weren't mm-hmm. that many there weren't that many people that came through. It started late and it ended late, and the show is very much punctual. And if you go right. in late, you go in late. You have to wait. Uh, they don't take. They don't let you go in. But they let everybody go in, and they started the show late. Go ahead. Right. Now. now, while you were while you were out there at the red carpet, inside, Mr. Cozen was in there and uh, was hearing some very interesting stuff. Yeah, um, I sort of knew that. I think probably a lot of people knew that the pre-show was going to be unusual mixes of. Uh, catalog stuff um wasn't sure what the nature of them was going to be it turned out that basically what they were were uh instrumental backing tracks without the vocals um of oh, wow. an, uh, yeah of an awful lot of stuff um 
uh, I, I made a list of um, some of them. Uh, Got to Get You Into My Life was playing when I walked in, which was pretty much as soon as the doors open. Uh, then Girl and Your Bird Can Sing. Uh, with a little help from my friends. I mean, those two aren't such a big deal because you've, you've been able to sort of get those from, you know, either Rock Band or the, the, the Pepper things that have leaked out. Everybody's uh, got something to hide except for me and my monkey. You don't, you don't hear the instrumental track of that so much. Penny Lane. The instrumental track of that is really beautiful because you hear the oboe lines and things going on in a way that you mm. don't really hear when the vocal's there because you're focusing on the vocal. Um, and yeah. I think they mix the oboe line up a bit too. And they left the trumpet outro, ah. which was, I thought, a nice huh. touch. Um, Sun King. And I love her. Absolutely gorgeous as an instrumental, as you can imagine. Uh, mm. I'm only sleeping with a count in. Uh, you never give me your money. Uh, Sun King, Mean Mr. Mustard. Let's see if I have any others elsewhere in the book here. Taking sloppy notes and uh, <laughs> and also uh, accidentally recorded a bunch of it until it began to mm. and, and, <laughs> until you know so many people were coming in and you know they're they're sort of talking and so there's no point you know you, mm -hmm. you sort of can't hear it anymore and i'm thinking well i mean wait a minute people don't quite understand that they're hearing mixes that they cannot <laughs> otherwise hear and they're just having conversations oh yeah tax man i'm looking through you dear prudence good morning good morning how long did that i mean because we came in just before it started i mean because the the red carpet thing ended very quickly and then they brought they started telling people to go in and then all of a sudden out in the lobby they said we're going to start in 10 minutes yeah. how long did how long were you sitting in there uh from about um 7 30 when the doors opened so i would say close to maybe 40 minutes wow um, yeah so that was a lot of fun and uh yeah. And all those takes, Alan, all those takes were the release versions, right? Just without the vocals. Yeah. There were no I mean, alternate, in, right, no alternate takes. Right. Like I mean, in one case, there was a count in, which, which isn't, you know, like released. Mm. And then there was the yeah. trumpet ending. But yeah, they were the standard. They were the standard takes just mixed without the vocals and really just sounded gorgeous. I mean, I sort of was wishing that, you know, nobody else would come in so I could just keep listening to these things. <laughs> <laughs> Did the the Penny Lane that you heard was it a lot like the anthology version? Because that one you could hear. Um, I'm not sure if you if I'm pronouncing it right. The Cor Anglais. Yeah. You know that part. Did you hear that mixed in? Was that boosted yeah, up in the mix? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it it was more like otherwise it was, it was more like the released version, just without the vocals and uh, mm. you know and. I don't know, maybe the piano, maybe the keyboards were down a bit too, because I don't remember that being uh, that present. But, um, yeah. So that was a lot of fun. And then, you know, by, I'd say, about 8.15, it was supposed to start at 8, uh, so between 8.10 and 8.15. Um, they're still sort of playing. Uh, they had cycled back to Got to Get You Into My Life again, and uh, some of the characters began walking out sort of more or less into the audience and uh like in front of us there was a sort of a guy with a the, the guy with the big tea kettle you know and the steam coming out of it and cup uh and uh various other characters other places in the room um where we were sitting was right opposite where Paul and Ringo and their wives and Yoko and everybody were. Um, and so consequently, the show is in the round. And so behind us, there was a video screen that was exactly showing exactly the same stuff as what was directly in front of us. So everybody sees the same thing, basically. Um, mm. It's just that uh, when at the end, when uh, Paul and Ringo and Giles and uh, I guess Dominic Champagne got up to speak at the end, um, they were across the stage. So we were sort of looking at their back. There is, however, uh, a number of YouTube clips out there showing them from the front. So I was able to catch up mm. on what that looked like. <laughs> I actually I posted some of that on my Facebook page. Uh huh. 
Okay. So I did get to to see the like the closing comments from Paul and Ringo and yeah. Giles too. Right. That was mm-hmm. real. That was really cool. I mean, that was worth the whole trip just to hear that. And I wrote actually this morning or last night that that should that audio should be tacked on to the end of the show and be there every day, every time. Cause I think that would be perfect. You don't need to see them to hear, to enjoy that. Yeah. Cause Paul and Ringo were just having a blast yeah. and I would love to hear that ending every time, you know, you know, yeah. Ringo, uh, Paul going, uh, he, he made a, he joked with him about, uh, uh, octopus's garden, uh, something about, we heard that a lot in the show. <laughs> I mean that was, and you know I mean I thought that was great that was just perfect yeah. and Ringo Ringo was funny too because he said something like and I thought I looked good you know <laughs> in the show yeah. right well Giles was in in some ways the most serious because I mean he started off by mentioning his father and and yes. and the show was dedicated to George Martin um, mm-hmm. the, the the announcer at the beginning was one of the characters who who recurs throughout the show. You came out and made you know welcomed everyone made an announcement and also and and welcomed uh you know Paul and Ringo and Yoko and Olivia even though she wasn't there and said that the show was was dedicated to Sir George Martin and uh and then Giles came out and said that you know he lost his father this year and he misses him and you know and didn't you know wait for applause or anything just went right into and John's not here and George isn't here and he's looking mm. at Paul and Ringo and says uh but it's you know because of you the music lives on and uh um but he also noted that i mean this was the day that uh you know a you know psychopathic nihilistic yes. lunatic um went mm. driving through a crowd in nice, in, in and, nice. Yeah. and he just alluded to it saying you know something really terrible happened in the world tonight but it's great to know that there is you know still you know this music in the world that uh is not going to harm you and make, you know, and it's about peace and love and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and there was that. So, you know, none of those things were sort of dwelt upon, but they were all touched upon. And, and, and I think that was about right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. So, and then, yeah. yeah. Now the, uh, the show itself, yeah. especially for people like me who have never seen it or people like Ken, who, Ken, you said you, you've seen it once. Yeah, it was, it was right. almost 10 years ago. I think it might right. have been 2007. So how, so. Is the, how is the show different now from where it's been the last decade? Well, Steve either, either, either of before, you. I haven't. So um, okay. I, I know what some of the changes were, but if Steve has specific memories, maybe we should go with, with him. Okay, well, Steve? Most, most of what I – I mean, they didn't provide – unfortunately, they did not provide us with a list, and I honestly – it has been a long time since I've seen it, so I didn't have everything marked down. But the one, the things I noticed were the the effects, the uh, with the uh, um, while my guitar gently weeps, which of course everybody's seen in the video. And what was the other song where they were dancing on the on the um, on the draw on the, like the drops with the was that? Well, there was Maybe. a lot of that. Um... Yeah, with Well My Guitar Gently Weeps, I mean, you, you've probably seen the pictures, and there's still video online of the old version, um, which is similar in a way where the the woman the, who's the main character in it is sort of trying to, like, almost try to get in contact with, you know, a guy, uh, and but he's, in the old one, is kind of like a... Uh, not a mannequin. I mean, it, 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 he's, like, made out of flowers or cloth things or something it's like a rope person almost um mm-hmm. and now what it is is he's an illusion you know he's he's totally projected um right which which makes it so, a little more magical in a way you know before it was kind of stagey magic and now it was sort of high-tech magic the the technology is um, supposed to be one of the biggest differences um, right. They're projecting things on and from the stage, which I don't think they were able to do before. A lot of things are the same as we've seen, you know, for instance, like Help was the roller coaster one, you know, uh, sorry, sorry, roller skate one where there are, you know, uh, four 
with all the effects, with all the near cr- crashes and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. really mm-hmm. pretty stunning. And, you know, at, at certain points in it, you, you see the four skaters sort of all on the top of one of these sort of mountain-like things that they skate up. And, you know, and the impression is that, like, okay, these, these are sort of the Beatles, you know, at, on a, at a kind of peak. See a lot of a lot of it is interesting. Um, one of the complaints I had always heard about the show was that it didn't have much of a plot, but now it definitely has kind of a plot. I mean, it begins <laughs> in. Well, I mean, it has a. You're here's, right. Here's what it is. It 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 has a sort of a wraparound plot in a way, which is the story kind of of the Beatles, but with a lot of fantasy and a lot of commentary worked into it. So Mm -hmm. in the beginning, you know, when we hear Because and Get Back, it's really, you know, kind of Liverpool uh, in the war days and just after the war days and kind of, you know, bombed a bit. And uh, and then with it goes into Twist and Shout, which they have substituted uh, for I'm the Walrus. I'm the Walrus is out and Twist and Shout is in. And the version of Twist and Shout is not much different than the LP, I didn't think. Did you notice anything about it, Steve? No, I yeah, didn't. I didn't. It, it seemed like the standard studio track, really, not much in the way of mashups. Um, but that's supposed to be, you know, the birth of rock and roll from which the Beatles emerge and all that. But, but then it goes on to, you know, the sort of spacey... Um, fantasy aspects like while my guitar gently weeps which everyone has seen and uh you know you see the sergeant pepper walking through it every now and then and the yellow submarine imagery and uh uh, volkswagen beetle imagery turns up a lot uh there are a couple of different Mm -hmm. ones uh there is a sort of political section with revolution and back in the ussr in revolution uh Actually, with both of them, uh, but the, the mood changes is uh, where they're, the dancers or acrobats are on trampolines, and there's a big Volkswagen bus, and uh, they're jumping from the trampolines onto the top of the bus and then back down, and then there are nets behind them, which they're sort of jumping backwards onto and sort of grabbing onto. I mean, one thing that really impressed me, I mean, I never was that interested to tell you the truth, in sort of acrobatic acts, but the sheer amount of skill, you know, that that you would have to have developed to even get into this show, even to pass the audition, um, Mm. has to be really remarkable. Um, Mm -hmm. And Mm. a lot of the dancing, I mean, yeah, I, I guess the difference between them being acrobats and dancers is that a lot of it's taking place suspended in the air and on trapezes but this was classical ballet from my point of view an awful lot of Mm -hmm. it you know and up in you know somewhat more dangerous conditions than ballet dancers normally have to do Um, right wow so Mm -hmm. you know and so so for a lot of the songs like yesterday and uh something you know these are sort of relationship things a little bit like well my guitar gently weeps there's a lot about sort of reaching for some sort of a relationship that's just beyond your grasp but then there's also you know uh, back again to the biographical stuff i mean at the end of a day in the life they make a connection even though it's at the end of the song not in the relevant verse but you know the the song begins with a a car crash right so it Mm -hmm. ends on that you know last big sustained chord you see a small boy sort of you know standing there looking forlorn and you had seen him earlier in the song sort of you know bouncing on a a bed with his mother uh who you know clearly is clearly julia and john and Mm. it's clearly you know John sort of after Julia's death and then it goes into Hey Jude Um, Mm -hmm. so it was kind of interesting because Hey Jude is supposed to be a song Paul wrote to Julia to calm Mm -hmm. down Julia you know but here it's being shown as uh, you know for John so I I thought it was you know obviously a lot of creative um, 
liberties are taken, you know, I don't think anyone's going to get upset about the fact that here it's John instead of Julian, but, uh, you know. Well, I, matter, I, matter of fact, actually, John even said in one of the, I think one of the last interviews that he felt that, uh, that Paul actually had written Hey Jude for him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so it's, so it's more artistic liberty, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, uh, and then I'll, I'll turn this over to Steve because I've been talking for a while, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't go in 2006 and I didn't go because sort of as a matter of principle, you know, my, my, my feeling was that the Beatles had more important things to do than a site specific show in Las Vegas <laughs> with acrobats. Mm-hmm. Um, they had not yet released the remasters. They hadn't and still haven't released the let it be, uh, you know, it's special edition that's supposed to have been sitting on the shelves and Shay and all kinds of stuff. And then I felt, you know, I, I, I'm just not going to go, <laughs> but I did hear the music. I think I, I might've said last week for Giles Martin came to New York and played me in on a hard drive and it just knocked mm. me out because, you know, you're not hearing it from a CD. You're not hearing it with any compression. This is just the hard drive with his, copies of the masters and it just sounded incredible so i thought okay well fine you know i'm I'm, I'm into the music of this i'm still not that interested in the acrobats but when it got to be the 10th anniversary and they said well you know would you come out and see it i thought well actually this show has been running for longer than the beatles actual you know performing and recording career at this point. <laughs> right. that's right yeah and uh you know it's it should be I, I should see it and i have an opportunity so i'm gonna go and i'm really glad i did because you know I, I really enjoyed it i'm sure you enjoyed the speakers and the seats you know i yeah. they were not that evident you know I really have to yeah. say. I, I have to i have to agree with that because okay this was my, this was my second time and I, the one thing that I noticed the first time that seemed a little disappointing to me was everybody had said, well, you know, you have this atmospheric type, you know, enveloping you. Mm. I, I sat there and, and uh, you know, I'm going, maybe I'm getting too old. Maybe my hearing is going or something, but I didn't see it either. You know, I mean, it's very loud. And in fact, it, at one point, it's actually distorted in there. But mm. Yeah, I, yeah, I I thought the same thing, Alan. I I didn't catch there. There was no question that the sound is all over the place. The LA Times used the um, discre- uh, said something about the Beatles being all around you, and I think that's a great description of what basically that is. is it, mm-hmm. it, it, it puts you kind of in the middle of the whole thing. Um, yeah, but yeah, Actually, I mean, I, go ahead. That was my that was my experience when I saw it. You know, many years ago, is that. I just felt that with the audio uh, on my on the sides of of my seat, you know, and a lot of it's very fascinating to listen to. And I'm trying to watch what's right there in front of me on stage. Mm -hmm. There's too much to absorb all at the same time. I Mm -hmm. found it to be it. it, You know, it's very I don't want to say distracting. It was all fascinating, Mm -hmm. but it was a lot Mm -hmm. to take in. I don't think that you can get the full appreciation of the show with just one one seeing it one time. So. uh, I agree. Uh, because yeah, I, I, there's I, stuff I, happening all over the stage, you know, and uh, yeah, it's and, uh, and I and I I'd have to say that I appreciated it more the second time. How so? It well because it 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 just seemed to the whole thing seemed to make sense a little bit better. Maybe it's the second version that makes sense because you know I obviously I saw the first version, but. It just seemed the whole the, the whole concept seemed to make a little more sense, and yeah, and you're also sitting there waiting for the, I don't have my notes here, uh, but you're also sitting there waiting for the uh, you know the chain the the outtakes and stuff and the variations and mm-hmm. you know so that's that's fun too. But yeah, I, I agree that you know that uh, I mean it it is a good show, and I we're we're actually talking about going back again, although not just yet but i mean because especially that that horrible drive but uh yeah. we definitely want to go back there and stay in the mirage and and see it again um because i mean it, it was just it, it's just a, it is just a good show it's it, it's it's fun but um yeah i mean I, I i i enjoyed it i i did you know so steve what did what you, you make of the um you know, there was 
the long scene actually it went over two songs with you know crosses in one point a Ku Klux Klan guy and crosses burning. Do, yeah. Um, do you know? Do you know? I I met uh, Bruce Spicer in the in the in the uh, Beatles shop in the which by the way if you do go to the Mirage you have to visit and you'll probably end up spending a lot of your money there. But uh, the the Beatles souvenir shop is just uh, amazing. It's incredible. But anyway, yeah, yeah. But anyway, Bruce and I were talking and I said. What did you think of that? And he said, "Well, yeah, that's kind of what it was, you know." And and I th- that had me that put me off a little bit. I was kind of like, "Really? Are they really doing that?" But there obviously is not, I, and I'm sure a lot of people will take that, or some people will take that literally, being the way things are. Um, obviously, there's a there's a difference there. Uh, Bruce thought it was pretty much about the, you know, about the, what they endured, uh, you know, in the sixties, well, like sure. the, 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 this thing and the John, mm-hmm. you know, the John statement. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, Paula said, Paula said that she, my wife, Paula th- said that she thought she had heard in the, in the soundtrack, a, a quote of John, the bigger than Jesus thing. I, I didn't hear it. And um, yeah, I didn't hear- I listened to a recording that I accidentally made. I didn't hear it on there either. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> um, <laughs> but well, you know, for research, I had to be able to you know, revisit. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. I know. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it seemed clearly a reference to the 1966. Uh, you know, tour. I mean, it may, may, maybe it simply suggested it, itself to her. And, uh, but, um, yeah. Also, um, I guess, you know, one of the questions I had always had was okay, what's the difference between the album and what's in the show? Yes. Um, and so, you know, apart from things like Twist and Shout, which aren't on the album, there are sections where there is a lot of uh, studio chatter. And it, well, that that was in the show the first time. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, mm-hmm. there was one section, and I can't, and I left my notes in the other room. There was one section with a whole bunch of talking at the beginning of a song that I had not. Well, at the beginning, for one, they they opened the show with with some talking that kind mm-hmm. of moved all around you, which was actually kind of cool. Yeah, there was one section, and I can't remember which one it was that that had that too. By the way, did you notice the difference in the sound? how good strawberry feels forever sounded yeah it was like being in a uh in a theater with you know with five one sound i mean well it was just all around you it was amazing yeah. that was amazing yeah that strawberry was- fields also i mean i don't know if the original show uh, you or ken might remember uh began the way the record begins which is with the demos and goes through a few demos and then the acoustic one at abbey road and then into the song um, here it just started as the finished song. I mean, at the end there were all kinds of mashups going on. There was "Hello mm-hmm. Goodbye" and uh, you, you know lots of of other things, um, piggies, mm. all that. You know, but uh, but the beginning it just started right in as Strawberry Fields. So mm-hmm. um, I don't recall it, there being the demo and uh, the earlier take. You do. I, I do. That. Mm. I, yeah. I do. I I see. Yeah. Okay. But I don't I don't I'm just What was you know, here but... instead was a bunch of studio chatter and I don't know if this is different where they had false starts and jokey starts of Lady Madonna let it be mm-hmm. Paul starts Hey Jude and John says I I don't want to hear that now. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Was that in the old show? Or was I, that... I think it, I think I think it was. I yeah. think I think it was some of that. Yeah. So that was. Um, I know there was a lot of chatter, but I don't remember those yeah. exact words. But yeah. yeah. Now, of course, with with events like this, there's always an after party. So mm-hmm. maybe you can give us kind of a quick uh, wrap up of uh, of that. Let me say one quick thing before we get into yeah. the party is um, getting back to the Beatles shop. They issued a, it started selling online uh, in the shop the day of the show. They issued a 10th anniversary love program supplement that they were selling. You, you could actually buy them. I think you could buy them separately, but we I bought it together. And it's basically, it's just, a, it's not nearly as big as the, for, it's about a third, maybe as big as the original, um, and it has quotes from everybody in it, from Yoko, from Giles, 
from Ringo, from Olivia, you know, and pic- and pictures from the show. So there is that for those of you that go. And it, like I said, you can buy a bundle. You can buy just the two programs. I believe you can buy the CD uh, and the DVD also with the programs. They did not have the... Uh, the DVD being all together now, the the film they do not mm. have, and nobody, and and it's not, and you can get it on Amazon used, but it's not apparently available separately. Is the original CD DVD combination that came out when the album came out? Mm. So apparently that's out of print. Well, uh, that was that would have been probably the only thing in existence in the Beatles catalog that they didn't have in that store. Um, yeah, and we're talking yeah. about group stuff. The only solo stuff there was there was I saw a new and I saw one of Ringo's albums. Uh, did you? Yeah, because oh, there was one. Of I did, you know, it was funny. I was, I kept listening to the. Uh, I mean, they're playing Beatle music all through the hotel almost continually. Yeah, and I heard I heard several tracks from new but i didn't hear any ringo solo stuff at yeah. all yeah they had one album each from them there but otherwise it was all group stuff but they had every group thing in every configuration except well not cassette and a track but uh <laughs> you know but for instance you know the big mono vinyl box was there the big stereo vinyl box was there the, well, the right. individual cds the individual vinyls um, plus, you know, pretty much any kind of Beatles trinket you could imagine, um, you know, cups and key holders and key rings and uh, uh, T-shirts. T-sh- beach, oh, be- oh, T-shirts, beach, Million, millions of T-shirts, towels. Beach towels, beach towels. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was actually, though, a lot of fun walking through that place. I mean, the CDs, I mean, I, look, I, it's not like there was any danger of my actually having to buy any of those because – I have everything that they had, but you know, they were like 19 bucks, the CDs and the vinyl. And I'm thinking, you know, who actually pays $19 for a CD yeah, these days? Really? Somebody, somebody told me they had the, and I didn't check the price, the hot, the yellow submarine hot wheels that were selling at Walmart for a dollar. They had them for $8 a piece. Hmm. Yeah, I can believe it. So, it, it now, no, now, I'm mm-hmm. sure there are a lot of casual fans that went that go to see Love. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, you know, they probably have money to burn. They're in Las Vegas and nineteen dollars is not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Probably yeah. so not. Okay. it's right there. You know, yeah. it it's uh yeah, you, you know, can get you can I, get swept up in the moment of being in that shop, you can. just getting all this stuff. I mean, I can see that. Um, I'm but just, for instance, if you didn't get swept up in the moment and you get home and you hear that there is this bundle of the uh, you know the old and new program and things like that, can those be obtained by mail or online? Yeah. Or? Yes, you have, to, you have to call them. There's a. a I print when I wrote it up last night on my on the blog on my blog. I put mm-hmm. the phone number. They don't have an online link. Yeah. Did you, okay. Alan? You were going to call them, right? Did what? you call them for the pro- Did you call them for the program and order it? I haven't yet, but I'm going to do that tomorrow. Um, I have the number here. Uh, it is seven zero two seven nine two seven seven two nine. Or for those of you, you could write to Beatles dot shop at Cirque du Soleil dot com. Oh, you picked up. Oh, I didn't see the link. I, I thought you could only call them. OK, well, yeah, that's just for an email. I mean, there's no like website or anything that would be handy. Right. But, that's, uh, that's, that is. Kind of, and I and, looked I actually looked online because obviously the, the Beatles uh, or Bravado uh it has the online links, but I didn't find a lot of that. So I no. went looking for the coffee cups that you bought, and I didn't find those huh. from Bravado. So apparently, you can only get those from the uh, from the from the store. Oh yeah, the, I went to Bravado. I was looking for the yeah. Okay, I bought the I bought the souvenir program and assumed it was the current souvenir program and didn't see the the tenth anniversary one. So right. my program book is the old show and so obviously now I need the tenth anniversary the one. one. Right. And and went online and nobody has it. Uh and it's mm-hmm. not in Cirque du Soleil's own website store or anything like that. So I'm gonna have to call them and uh and get those. But uh yeah. 
Yeah, it was it was this the store was fun, I got to say. You know, I mean a lot of it is a, a lot of people may be thinking, "Oh, you know, trinkets, you know, really who needs it?" But it was a lot of fun. It was fun to see. Mm-hmm. It was a great atmosphere, you know, playing Beatles music. It's, you know, and the party, good. the party afterwards was 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 kind of fun. Yeah, like you, I we only stayed there an hour. Um I should mention that they had two Beatles related drinks. Orange submarine and strawberry fields, oh. and and uh, yeah, and um, the the uh, strawberry fields had vodka and the orange submarine had rum, and that was the one I had, and it was it it did not seem very strong. Yeah, I had the strawberry field, I'm, so we've tasted them I, both between us. I'm a, I'm a wimp, <laughs> and and believe me, if it was if it was anywhere near strong, I would have walked out of there half drunk, and I did not. I had two of them. And a glass of wine, and and I was fine. So, wow. Did you find the same thing that they, it wasn't very strong? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't very strong. But I mean, it was it was it was tasty. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I like the orange sundae. I thought it was great. It was, but was otherwise, great. you know, as a party, I mean, I, I it's like we didn't really see. Uh, I I didn't in any case see any of the principals or Giles or you know any of those people. I mean, they were off sort of in their own section of the party there were, and, there were people mm, hanging yeah. there were people hanging around where they exited out where you know the entrance to that area and uh somebody showed me a picture that she had taken of giles and sean so but yeah there were i mean there were people that bugged them as they came out but but sure. other than that other than that no they did not walk around at least not while we were there because we didn't stay very long either the food itself was because eh, uh, we were starved. We hadn't eaten, mm. and they had they had uh, they did have uh, was it ribs? I think they had yeah, or sand- they had sandwiches. That's what it was. Little sliders that we were able to uh, that we found, but those were few and far between. It was mostly you know bread and hummus and stuff like that. Because but it, it sounds like it was an outstanding experience. Yes, for uh, for both of you, and uh, before we turn to Ken for a review of uh, last night's concert, <laughs> I kind of feel like the there was a uh, Johnny Carson used to do a bit where on the Tonight Show where he would uh, hear what Ed, what Ed and and Doc had been doing all the shows that Doc had been doing and Ed doing you know, uh, the, uh, Star Search and all of the other things uh, that he was doing, and uh, Ed would ask. Uh, oh, Johnny, what did you do? And he would say something like, "Oh, I went over to Burke Convy's house and he uh, rotated my tires." <laughs> so, but I, while I didn't have either of the experiences you guys had this weekend, I did have on Saturday a very nice time, a very nice lunch with uh, Alan. Will appreciate this with uh, Brad Hunt who's a, a longtime contributor to Beatle fan, uh, probably our our principal book uh, book reviewer mm-hmm. and his bride Shannon and uh, had a, had, a, had a very very nice time and uh, uh, Brad says that he listens to the show so I just wanted to sort of give him uh, give him a, a shout out and uh, say how much appreciated uh, you know having um, having lunch over the weekend. Yeah. So, yeah, Thanks. it was a good Thank weekend for, for that. It was a good weekend for that because Steve and I have never met personally, and so now yeah. we have. In oh, Las okay. Vegas. And Chuck Gunderson was out there too, and lots, so many people. You know, it's it's sure. uh, it was great. Uh, before we get uh, get to Ken's review of the McCartney show, uh, there's a little bit of intrigue, Steve. And I believe also Alan heard something at the uh, at the after party, and it's kind of been reverberating the last couple of days. So yeah. uh, it's as as we're recording this, nothing is absolutely definite. But uh, Steve, both of us have heard that uh, there's going to be a companion release to the movie, which sh- shouldn't su- surprise anybody. Mm-hmm. The Ron the Ron Howard movie. The Ron Howard movie. Right. What what we're hearing is that uh, Hollywood Bowl is coming in some form. So um, there's no details yet because it has not been announced. We don't know how much of the bowl, uh, you know, how many bowl bowl shows will be released. Whether all the the three shows that were bootleg will be released. 
so we don't know. Uh, nothing's been released yet. Or, but I yeah, think no, we've nothing. we've both heard that there's going to be an announcement this week, possibly. Right. Right. Right around the same time the show finally goes online. Yes. So, exactly. Right. Yeah. Oh. So, yes, so, it was so, interesting with all these all these Apple people hanging out there, and Ron Howard was out there, and so all this stuff is sort of swirling around, unattributed, mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So we don't even know if it's strictly audio or video as well, or anything of that nature. What I've heard only is about audio. Yeah, um, same here. Okay. Yeah. Same here. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Hmm. We we shall see. Uh, well, probably, as, uh, as Alan said, probably by the time uh, this uh, the show first drops on uh, on Wednesday, we probably will uh, will know for sure. But then, who knows? These things change at the uh, at the drop of a hat. Right. Who knows? So last night, Mr. Michael saw Paul McCartney at Fenway Park in Boston, where I saw Paul uh, in two thousand nine, and. It's Fenway Park for a stadium. Fenway Park is a great venue for for uh, for a concert. Absolutely, do you agree? You're Ken? not kidding. You're not kidding. And I, and I will say this: um, I've been to many a McCartney show. I must have seen. I've never done a count. I'm figuring probably 25 times I've seen Paul in concert. Mm-hmm. Nowhere near in in, in the uh, the range of a Rick Rick Lover. No uh, <laughs> but. Um, I've never seen a crowd more pumped up at a Paul McCartney show as the one that I saw last night. And I, apart from the fact that it is Paul McCartney, I love going to Fenway Park or to any really historic baseball stadium. Uh, I love the look of it, and so much of it looks like it hasn't been touched mm-hmm. <laughs> for many years, and I just love the feel of that. But um, this was, and I'm really surprised that I'm saying this, this was one of the best concerts I've ever seen him give. Really? and. Um, after all the talk here on this show and elsewhere about his voice, I think his voice was the best I've heard him in several years. Granted, it's not what it was in 76 when I saw him in Wings Over America. And I remember the 93 tour thinking his voice was perfect when I saw him. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's the best I've heard him in years, definitely. And the only thing that I found really frustrating, and this happens quite a lot when I see Paul, is that I'm there for the whole experience. It's not just to to watch the performance, but obviously I care about the man's voice a lot. I treasure that voice. Right. I think it's one of the greatest voices ever in music. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to focus on that, and there are so many songs there in particular the Beatles songs, where the crowd is singing along and loud <laughs> right. to the point where, where I can barely hear Paul. And there are also times, and I should, I should have said this years ago because Steve and I, we've done this show now for, I guess it's like four years, and that you know the first few years it was just you and me. But one of the problems that I have in, in seeing Paul in concert is that the mix of the show is such that it's almost equal. What the, the guitars and the drums are equal with Paul's voice to the point mm-hmm. where Paul has to fight to be heard. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's what puts a strain on his voice. Mm-hmm. Granted, you know, this is his show. He has the final say. He should be in control of all this. But I think that might be part of the problem why his voice has deteriorated, you know, a bit in the last several years. Certainly, there are those moments. Maybe I'm amazed as much as I love the song. I wish that he'd drop it because he really can't. He can't sing that song like he used to it. Anything close to it anymore. There are certain songs like I've Got a Feeling where he's struggling to uh, to hit the higher notes. But for the most part, he was fine. I mean, he wasn't any worse than I've heard him the last several years. Mm-hmm. And... The one moment that really impressed me the most when I could just focus on the voice, there are two songs he does in a row where it's just him and an acoustic guitar and nothing else. And that's Blackbird and then Here Today. Right. When he did Blackbird, it was the best I've heard him ever sing it in a long time with no flaws, no strain in his voice, nothing. Mm. Mm. It was perfect. And then he did Here Today. And... Uh, with the exception of one note, which a higher note, which he didn't hold on to, he didn't strain at all. I mean, it was the, the, the best performance I've probably heard him do of here today. So when you can just focus on the voice 
when you just have him and an acoustic guitar, that's when you can tell, you know, uh, in the show that his voice is still good. I was so impressed overall with the set list that I, I'm shocked. I really am shocked that I'm saying this because I'm so spoiled seeing Paul so many times and I want to see a lot of changes in the set list. Right. And from the very moment that we knew about the start of this tour, we knew of only two songs that he added that he's never done in his solo career, A Hard Day's Night and Love Me Do. Right. And to me, that's not enough to keep it interesting. But he did a lot of songs that he hasn't done for a long time, and his voice was in great shape. I especially loved In Spite of All the Danger, which sounded yeah. fantastic with the I, band. I, I, I did, too. I thought that was fantastic. What did you think of the, the black and white with my valentine? It was nice. It was Wasn't nice. Beautiful? And this crowd was very respectful. It's not like, you know, we talk about the crowd leaving when there's a solo song. They were right. leaving whether it was Beatles or solo. I didn't really see that big a difference. I observe all this stuff. And um, apart from that, one of the biggest surprises of all, he's at the piano and he's doodling a little bit. And he's doing what I thought was his usual introduction to The Long and Winding Road. Because he always plays something before oh, yeah. he launches into it, and mm -hmm. instead, he does here, there, and everywhere. Hmm. Yeah, he he's at been doing, the piano. At, he's been wow, doing, he's been doing that because uh, yeah. somebody else mentioned that to me about another show. So that's mm. been kind of a thing that he's it's it's not it, it, he's been working that in every show. Just yeah, nice. well, I knew he was doing the song, but I didn't know he was playing the piano to it. Mm. Because in the past, whenever he's done here, there, and everywhere, it's on acoustic guitar. Right. Like on Unplugged and um, I guess the 2002 back in the U.S. tour, mm -hmm. um, it was acoustic guitar. It's kind of ironic. He plays here, there and everywhere on the piano. And then he does You Won't See Me, which was a real treat for me because I know I can watch the videos on YouTube of him doing the song. But I've never been in the venue when he's done You Won't See Me. Mm -hmm. And he's playing on acoustic guitar and I'm used to thinking piano. But you won't see me. <laughs> right. So he's switching the instruments there. And his voice was fine for that. I just think that he really controlled his voice very well throughout the whole show. Let's face it, I care tons about that man's voice. And, and I was really surprised. Now, keep in mind, this is one isolated show here. I can't speak for the whole tour. But from where I was sitting, I thought it was the best that he sounded in several years. And I think that even though you only have those two new additions there were enough changes to keep it interesting. Well, that's ironic, that's ironic because we were talking about this yes. <laughs> on the road yesterday. Is there's a story in the Daily Mail that uh, complaining about his voice and using, of course, uh, anonymous sources, which I can't stand. Uh, you know, and, and, I mean, it's basically just a British tabloid slag piece. Mm -hmm. But it was basically saying his voice is shot and... and so I, you know, I mean, and and there were people defending because I posted it on my Facebook page, and there were people defending defending the story, and also defending him. So there were, you know, it was a kind of like a battle, you know. Well, um, but but no, I'm glad you I'm glad you said that because you know it, it's worth saying, um, and we've talked about this before. I mean, you know, I mean we've we've done we've done this. We've gone through this on the show before. That, you but know, it's, that, it's important to bring up, and it, I don't mind repeating this. I think if you really want to judge Paul's voice, don't do it when he goes on television and does one song mm -hmm. live, like yeah. he did on Saturday Night Live, or a few songs. You've got to see a full show from start to finish, and then you can judge. Because from what many times when I've seen him live, and even going back to, say, the 89-90 tour, his voice is rough in the very beginning, and then as the, the show progresses, it gets stronger. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that is. It's that way with certain singers, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you need to see a full show in order to really judge what his voice is like. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not misleading people into thinking that it's like Wings Over America here. Oh, but no. for 74 years old, he sounds damn good to me. And the other thing that I wanted to bring up is that and I should have said this weeks ago when we were talking about Paul's voice, is that, yes, I'm very concerned about the overall performance, but that's not the only reason why you go to see Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the whole experience, and it's the fact that you've shared so much history with this man. And all I have to do is think back to a few shows that we did a few shows ago. We were talking about Wings Over America, and you were talking, Al, about Paul playing yesterday, mm -hmm. and you were in tears. Yep. 
you know, Absolutely. you're dealing with a man that has affected our lives in so many ways. And you get emotional over one song, which at that point, you know, we're talking 1976 is uh, 11 years old. Or mm-hmm. you've, had, you've had 12 years with that man from 1964 to 1976. Imagine people who have had another 40 years with that man right. in their lives. It's a very emotional thing. And when you also see visuals on the screen where you've got John Lennon there and you've got George Harrison there mm-hmm. and, you know, these people are no longer around and it, it gets to you. You realize that these people are so much a part of your lives. And now George yeah. Martin. And, of yeah. course, Linda McCartney. Linda. How can you not be emotional? Yes, I was going to say Linda McCartney. Yeah. How can you not? It's, it's not just the performance. It's the fact that this is someone that we've shared history with that's been like family to us. So, mm-hmm. you know, you can concentrate all you want about the voice, and I'm not denying that that's a big part of why I go. But there's so much more to it than that. Mm-hmm. I mean, imagine all the people. It's not like everyone who was exposed to Paul for the first time was with the Beatles. You could have gotten into Paul first from Wings, from the 80s on up, for whatever the reason. But when you have that much history, when you've shared so much of your life with this man who's been on the radio, on your, you know, on your stereo for so long, on your computer, how can it not get to you <laughs> that, you know, this is someone who's so important to us? So... And and just to see the appreciation that I saw in that audience. Oh, another thing? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, he made the point to say that he did In Spite of All the Danger, a song before the Beatles. And then he also said, and now I'm going to do a song that's from one year ago, which happened to be his last top ten hit, called Four right. or Five Seconds. Right. And he did the entire song, as opposed to uh, recently when he would just do a little bit on acoustic guitar and then go right into We Can Work It Out. Mm-hmm. And the whole crowd was singing four or five seconds. Really? The hmm. crowd was really into it. That's surprising. There's so many people around me that stood up throughout the whole concert. Really? And I, I've never, yeah, I've never been through that before. I've heard it been said that Boston is a big Beatles city. Yes, it is. And, I, and I've been to the other Fenway shows. He did two in 2009, like the one that you saw, Al. And mm-hmm. he did one in 2013, I think. And I was at all of those. This was the most excited crowd I'd ever seen. And to also see all ages there. I saw little kids with their parents. I saw teenagers. I saw teenagers bopping to 1985 and singing along with it. You know, and this is music. You know, it, when you reach a point where it doesn't matter when the music came out, when this music affects people of all ages, whether they're little kids or in their 70s, it doesn't matter. That's what's really important. You know, whether it's the Beatles, whether it's Wings, whether it's something current, the fact that these people are so into it and it's affecting all ages, that really is what impresses me apart from the performance to mm-hmm. see that, you know, mm-hmm. we're not just dealing with demographics and this mm-hmm. artist only appeals to that age group. You go to a Paul McCartney show, you go to that show I went to last night at Fenway Park, you'll see little kids all the way through people in their 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. It's not just the first-generation fans. Yeah. And that really moves me when I see that. When I see a range of T-shirts people are wearing, from Beatles shirts to, I saw a Paul at the Apollo shirt. You know, I love seeing all that stuff. So, um, you know, it's an extraordinary experience. You know, mm-hmm. and, and just to see that this man is so appreciated and so loved, and they pulled this stunt in the audience where they had... This one section all across the stadium where, depending on where you were sitting, you lifted up this, this sheet of paper and it read the words, Welcome Back, Paul. Ah, uh, that's what that you know, was all about. Yeah. I, heard, I heard about the, I saw the, I saw a picture of the sign, but I didn't know what it was all about. Right. Yeah. Another, another one of our regular listeners, Bob Ward of Fox 25 in Boston, yeah. uh, actually uh, confirmed much of what you saw, uh, said about the concert Right. Yeah. And not only you that, I, you guys heard about the surprises at the end of the show? Right. I'm surprised. Yeah, I was waiting for you to mention mm-hmm. that. Uh, how, uh, who, who, got, uh, who got the louder applause? That's what I'm curious about. Um, honestly, I think that um, 
Rob Gronkowski got the letter that's, of that's, applause. That's, that's kind hey. of what I would figured. That's, that's unfortunate. Kind of I, that's kind of what I figured. That Since I'm not out. even a football fan, I didn't even know who he was. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the crowd went wild, and he was dancing and playing air guitar to Helter Skelter. But before he went on stage, Paul introduced Bob Weir. Right. Yeah. Paul, and uh, Bob Weir came up there, played guitar, and sang along to High, High, High. Mm-hmm. How cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> and then he stayed on stage for Helter Skelter. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, great. In fact, I, I saw th- a post uh, that said the headline of which was, Paul is dead, with a capital D. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I think Paul said on stage, what is this, the Grateful Beatles? No. Yeah. Did you really say that? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, that's that's cool. But I love when when it's and it's happening a bit more often the last few years when he invites people on stage like like Diana Krall, you know, or uh, what was it, Chris Novacelic mm-hmm. from Nirvana. Those things, those are special moments. Not to mention when he invites fans on stage and they propose marriage or whatever, or he signs tattoos and things like that. I saw a post um, from somebody on Facebook that was sure she was going on stage last night, but uh, they didn't invite anybody on stage because of Weir and 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 Gronkowski. Gronk, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, I actually think that that was a surprise for Paul because before he introduced Bob Weir, he was pulled to the side, and some guy spoke to him, and you knew this wasn't part of the of the show. Mm-hmm. So then he mm. said, well, "We got a big surprise for you. This is someone I never performed with live, but Bob Weir is here." Let's bring him on, you know. Is that what he... Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> wow. Interesting. So, usually you think those things are all planned, but I think that one wasn't. And, yeah. and, and probably the same Maybe. thing with, uh, with, with Gronk. Maybe. Mm. No, that sounds like it was fun. Oh, it was an amazing wow. night. Yeah. But I think the crowd was just as important as Paul was. because I, I just never saw a crowd so into a show wow. from Paul as this one. Hmm. Wow. Wow. And that's, and that's anywhere. Uh, well, I mean, this because you've, you've said, you've said I think nothing you've will said ever you... compare to Wings Over America for me well, in terms yeah, of the show of itself and the performance oh, overall. Yeah. And but I would say definitely in recent years, certainly the last five years, this is probably mm-hmm. the best show I've ever seen. Wow, that is that is really saying something. Yeah. Can I can I uh, change the subject for a quick second? Um, uh, very quick because we're over time. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Live at the Hollywood Bowl is listed on Amazon.com for release on September 9th. Ooh. Hmm. Yes, that's, it pretty, is. that's pretty soon. Yeah, that is pretty soon. It's a, it says it's only one disc. Uh, well, that would be, what, a week before the film drops, right? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think so. Uh, Something like about, a, about a week. Yeah. Well, you know, you could fit all, all three concerts on one disc. Mm, not quite. Uh, uh, yeah, wait a minute. That would be, okay. be tight. Okay. Yeah. That's well, true. close that's, to it. That's true. Uh, uh, you couldn't. But so that means they're not going to. I mean, assuming that this is correct, because these listings have been known to change. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, yeah, it does say uh, September 9th, two thousand sixteen. Just one disc, and it does say Apple. So it's definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, I mean, it says uh, re- to be released September 9th pre-order now so there mm. we go they are, they are they are taking pre-orders because sometimes when the the you know if it's like a kind of an iffy type of you know very premature listing they aren't actually taking pre-orders but they are taking pre-orders hmm. interesting so uh we may uh, well again like like i said probably by the time uh this uh this airs uh, on wednesday first airs on wednesday uh we'll, we'll probably know more about this probably will yeah probably will. and so, so next week we can talk about the differences between hollywood bowl release and pure mccartney right <laughs> okay <laughs> Well, the the one thing we haven't done for Pure McCartney is to come up with our own list of what we think should be on there. Uh, hey, you know, Steve, you just had a contest that you ran online where you asked your own fans actually, there to do actually, that. Actually, we could, we could, I could pull some of those out and we could, we could mention those. But well, I oh, think it's more interesting what uh, what we would come up with. Well, I don't know if I want to go through that. Not mm, really. We but, should though. No. <laughs> No. Yes, yes, yes. 
No. Or at least a at least a, maybe a small playlist of songs that are not represented. Uh, maybe maybe accepting "Flowers in the Dirt" because since we now we we now know why uh, that's not represented on pure mccartney since from the man himself we know mm-hmm. that it's that it's going to be the next uh the next archive release perhaps uh, we should uh uh finally um <laughs> come up to the plate and uh give a you know give our our nominations for songs that should have been on pure mccartney and aren't anyhow t- it is time for us to uh tie for us to to say good night yeah, or, or or good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you, when you're hearing this. So anyway, uh, Steve, how do people get in touch with us? Uh, people get in touch with us by writing to things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We're also on Twitter at uh, things we said uh, fab. We have a Facebook page. We have there's actually two Facebook pages. One's for Fab Four Radio, but one is for the show. Um, you're welcome to join, and we'll get you in there, and we'll you can talk about the show there. I mean, we'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, we download the show and, and uh, take us to the gym with you. I've done that several times, and it's it's great. Mm-hmm, um, me too. Believe me, even though I know what the show says, it's fun listening. It, it's a it's a great thing to listen to while walking or on um, you know when you're exercising or whatever. Um, so. I recommend, and it's also healthy too. So there. yes, <laughs> indeed, gets the blood running. Gets the gets the blood running, yeah. Especially when we, you know, start getting a little crazy with the with the uh, opinions. But whatever. This is this is true. And Ken, now that you're back from Boston, what do you have on your website uh, coming up, and and also coming up on every little thing? Well, the usual rubbish. But it won't cost much. <laughs> uh, the Beatles, Beatles trivia and games page. There's Beatles trivia, trivia every single week. You can win one of nine prizes, including the Beatles one plus uh, Pure McCartney, Steve's favorite release. Uh, also, Kid Out Tools book, songs who we are singing, uh, and uh, just look right there on the Beatles trivia and games page. Every little thing. Maybe I should just put a plug in for this one mm-hmm. website from Germany, which you can stream many of my. Uh, syndicated every little thing shows which is mm-hmm. global global texan chronicles.com and just click on where it says ken michaels and many of my shows my one hour shows are there for you to listen to so a lot of past shows and uh, my newest ones too okay and also great. if mm-hmm. you if you want to uh, email me my email address is yes. every little thing every little thing at att.net okay mr cozen how do people get in touch with you um, I guess write to me through Facebook at either Alan Cozen or my alter ego, Alan Cozen Remixed, um, or through the uh, Things We Said Today email. Um, I, I check in on those pretty regularly and respond to them if they seem to require a response. So that would be the way. Okay. And- By the way, you can get to me at uh, BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I'm I may or may not change my email soon. I haven't. I was just going to ask. But uh, for now, it's BeatlesExaminer at gmail dot com. Okay, and you can reach me on Facebook at Al Sussman uh, or on Twitter at a s u s s forty nine or through Beetle Fan Magazine www dot dot com or www dot dot com for changing times one hundred and one days. That shaped the generation, especially for the twelve-year-olds on the NPR Politics podcast, and and this has been uh, as always. We have uh, what two topics that we figure will take up about half the show, and then we have to scramble from there. And and instead, we went over time again, as always. So, but it was a, a great discussion, and. Uh, For Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, this is Al Sussman. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time.